What do words mean to you? I had quite a, a negative experience with words. I just didn't use words as a form of communication. I would use like sounds and movements. I just felt like an alien a lot of the time. I was just like, why, why me? Why am I like this? Why do I act like this? Why do I react in certain situations like this? So I went to like a, a stage school every Wednesday made me who I am. It made me find my voice, literally. I think I'm still learning a lot about myself now, but the journey's never ending, I think. As long as you know who you are and you understand yourself, then the world's your oyster. We've had such a great response to the podcast, and so many of you have been in touch asking what you can do to help. It's really simple. Just follow, subscribe, wherever you get your podcasts. That way we can reach more people, and that way we can celebrate these great minds that think differently. As a child, Bradley Riches communicated through sounds and movement, but after being diagnosed autistic at nine, he discovered his voice through acting. Now, Bradley stars in the Netflix hit coming-of-age drama Heartstopper, playing James, a character who, like Bradley, is autistic. More recently, Bradley captured the hearts of the British public on Celebrity Big Brother by being raw and honest about his journey with autism. Let's get into it. Let's see how great minds think differently. I've seen, learn, and heard how amazingly vocal you are about neurodivergence and about being autistic. And so first thing to say is, Thank you for that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Why do you think that's important? I think growing up, I think you, there's a lot of shame. I think especially like you don't see many people in the media. I think there's a lot of shame about when I got diagnosed when I was nine. It was, I just didn't know where to look for. There was no one, no role models as such. And there was a, a shame and guilt about being autistic and being like, oh God, I'm different. I think if there was role models and people who spoke about neurodiversity very openly when I was growing up, I think I would have been less harsh on myself and more accepted myself earlier. So you were diagnosed autistic at nine. Yeah. How did that come about? So I, I got diagnosed because, so when I was growing up, I, I wasn't vocal. I didn't use words as a form of communication at all. And obviously my parents were like, oh, this is interesting. I just didn't use words as a form of communication. I use like sounds and movements. And then, and then obviously I got my diagnosis. And then as I got a bit older, I would start saying words. My first word was, well, I said, Ab so my sister's called Amber. And then I said, Abba. So I called my sister Abba, which is kind of camp. Um, and then um, from that moment, it was like, I then went into drama classes to get my confidence and try and try and basically different, use different ways to communicate via a character, which is obviously my love for acting. I've started using words while playing characters, which was kind of an escapism for me to use in my everyday life. And then obviously having not spoke ever, I then went to speech therapy because I couldn't pronounce a lot of words. And then from that moment, it was, it kind of just made sense. It's still a journey. I think I'm still learning a lot about myself now, but um, the journey's never ending, I think. And we understand that to be non-verbal, mm, yeah. correct? Yeah, 100%. Can you just talk a bit about why we say non-verbal? Yeah, I think loved ones would know um, how we're communicating. I think it's like I've met loads of non-verbal kids now, obviously doing my advocacy and stuff like that. And I think you you know what they're trying to put across. Like if they're upset, you'll know they're upset. If they're, if they're sh like stressed, you know they're stressed, but they just wouldn't verbally use words to describe how they're feeling because sometimes they wouldn't know how they're feeling. Um, so that's why we call the term nonverbal. And what was going on in your head being a nine-year-old, a, a young child, that meant you didn't use words? Yeah, it was hard. I, I've been asked this before and it was like, um, it's, it's one of the things I, like, I don't, obviously don't remember what I was, my, was going in my brain, but it was just like I didn't want to use words to communicate. I don't know if it was like a stress thing or an anxious thing. But yeah, I think it was hard to obviously to make friendships at that age. Everyone was, had their friend groups. I had one friend who just stuck by me. I'm still best friends with her now. And yeah, I think it was, it was difficult because you need to, in like in the world that we live in, you do need words to like communicate. Um, but I'm hoping, you know, as we're progressing in different um, scenarios, I think the world's more accessible, which is good. But yeah, it was hard to like make connections. Yeah, I, and 
presumably you felt different. Yeah, hundred percent. I felt yeah, felt hundred percent different. I always use the term. I just felt like an alien a lot of the time. Okay, it was just like people would look at me just like, oh, there, oh, there he is. Oh, there's the weird guy coming in. And then it was a shame thing as well. It was just like, why, why me? Why am I like this? Why do I act like this? Why do I react in certain situations like this? But yeah, I felt different, which now I know different is a beautiful thing and it's a great thing. But back then I saw it as a, a big negative. <laughs> I find it incredibly amazing and ironic that you were nonverbal and yet your career <laughs> yeah, is, is, <laughs> is lines and speaking and writing. Yeah. You are a published <laughs> author. What do words mean to you? I think I had a, quite a, a negative experience with words, obviously, because I couldn't pronounce my R's. Um, and my favorite TV show was Rory the Racing Car. So that's <laughs> ironic. But I think words to me now is, it's kind of like freeing freedom. It's like, saying or writing about how you feel and expressing your emotions. So yeah, I think if I describe one word for words, it would be freeing, I think. And so tell me about finding your voice then in terms of, yeah, moving from speech therapy and I guess acting classes to yeah. try and build your confidence to then actually falling in love with it and wanting to pursue it. So I went to like a, a stage school every Wednesday. My parents were a bit like sept sceptical, is that the word? Skeptical. 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 They were a bit like, um, oh, maybe this isn't for, maybe this will be, because my nan was like, take him to drama classes for confidence, stuff like that. My parents were like, oh, maybe this is a bit too much for him. Like being in a massive group of like people who are like, all theatre kids. <laughs> I am now a theatre kid. <laughs> but I went in there and it was all girls. And I walked in and I went, oh my God. It's not for me. I was like, all good. like obviously back then the shame of being a boy with a group of girls. Like, oh my god! And then I walked in and I was just, I just fell in. Like everyone was so nice, and it was like, I think with acting, uh, in the the acting class I went to, there was a lot of neurodivergent people in there, and I met this girl, and she had was ADHD, and she was just, she was just so open about speaking about, it. and then that confidence being with like like minded people, like I said, um, made me accept myself more, which made me be more confident. And then as my confidence grew, I was like doing i was playing bill sykes and oliver walking in with a hammer type thing and i was like oh maybe this is actually kind of fun this is this is a fun thing to do and then they're the girls who run the run the club they were like they pulled my mum to the side once i was like i think you could like carry on doing this i think i understand he could do it for a confidence thing but it's he's pretty good and then i got an anadin advert which was you know my professional debut i had to, <laughs> I had to run into a tent because it started raining so that, that they got me that was cool and then from that moment, it just kept going and going. And I was like, went to drama school and yeah, the, the love for acting. And I think it, cause I said it was freeing. I think that was, that's why I love it so much. Cause it made me who I am. It made me find my voice literally. Yeah. It's a great, uh, yeah, I can sort of picture a, you walking into a room full of girls and <laughs> the trepidation of getting into the acting school and then finding something that you're good at mm. and I mean, like props to your parents, props to your family, the drama school, because we hear this time and time again, certainly around neurodivergence of people finding the environments where they feel comfortable yeah. being really important and finding what they're good at, enjoy and are interested in being something to lean into rather than, yeah, try and be good at everything yeah. or get you better at the things that you're not so good at. I think like growing up, I see people in drama school, especially people, like, oh, this is my backup option. This is it. And I was like, oh God, I have no backup option. This is it. This is like, I put so much effort and so much interest into acting and singing and stuff like that. And it was like, if if this fails, I don't, I don't know what else I'm going to do. And then I don't know, I'll probably, I'll probably still be working in my coffee shop, which I absolutely loved. I loved working, loved making coffee. But what did you love about making coffee? I think... I think it's the end product. I think it was like, you know, you get the milk, you get the coffee and then you put it together. And I was slowly learning how to do the art stuff, but not that well. I mean, there's a great ritual and routine, I guess, to making coffee. Yeah, it's like a, an order. Yeah, 100%. There's a, for autistic people like you and I, there's a, there is a real social structure to a coffee shop, right? Oh, yeah. And I'm guessing there aren't lots of surprises. Yeah, there's a nice structure. And it was a small coffee shop, so it wasn't like overly busy and crazy, but I did sit in the toilet a couple of times, just sat there going, I'm burnt out and I want to go home. <laughs> so like, you were working in the coffee shop whilst pursuing acting? 
Yeah, so this is when I was at drama school. So okay. obviously like studying uh, Monday to Friday and then Saturday and Sunday just for extra money. I'd do um, making coffees. I want to talk about Big Brother in a bit, but one thing that I heard being said to you on a clip that I don't know, really, really touched me, I thought was really beautiful. You speaking about being autistic and them just saying, and I think this is a really important one for people to hear, how does it show up for you? I just think that is a really nice, kind, yeah. Open dialogue. Yeah. Really. Yeah, because that day I was feeling, it was like, I think, I can't remember, it was quite early on. It was like maybe the second day. So it was just the launch and that was quite overwhelming coming in and stuff like that. And the third day, it was like, I, I was just in the bedroom by myself, just having a moment. And then <laughs> Marisha was in the bed, like just further down. And I didn't know she was there. And then I was just doing my stuff. And then she was like, are you okay? And I was like, yeah. And then I just, I, you know, when you like someone asked you if you're okay, when you're not feeling great, I just started crying. And then, and then I was just like, I'm just nervous about how to greet people in the morning. It's just 16 people to greet in the morning is a lot. And it's like, if I say the wrong thing about saying hi to people and it's like, they might think I'm rude, but I'm not rude. I'm just me and I'm just having a minute type thing. So there's a lot of things in my head. And then, she, and then she obviously, when I started getting upset, she was just like asking about how it shows up. And that was a really nice way, open dialogue. Because I remember coming out and I was looking at all the videos they posted. And that was one in it. The, the comments were just so lovely. It was just like praising Marisha about how open dialogue, this is what every neurodivergent person needs to say how they feel, like without any judgment. And then, then people obviously praising about how open dialogue I was in that situation. And it was just a lovely moment. And and then later on, she fought for me in court in Big Brother about me being a coward. And then she she was praising all my neurodivergent, uh, neurodivergent advocacy. And then I was just like, she's a good egg. She's very good. <laughs> yeah, that's a real ally right there. Yeah. I, I think people are, and I, I notice this, we hear this. Sometimes people are not sure what to say. Yeah. Sometimes people are not sure they don't want to pry. What's been your experience of, I guess, publicly declaring and, and talking about the fact that you're autistic, what has been the response? I met a, a lovely girl called Chloe Hayden, who's also, she's in Heartbreak High, which is another Netflix show. She plays Queenie, which is an autistic character. And she was using her page for a lot of advocacy with ADHD and autism. And I was like, oh, this is, this is, this is cool that she's doing. This is cool. like, I feel inspired by her. And I was like, I might do the same, use my page. Obviously, she may have a big Australian audience. I was like, I could do the same with Hearts Up a lot. And then, a, a lot of obviously queer people are neurodivergent. That's what that's what happens, and, and people are really taking interest in being like, "Oh, this is really cool." I feel very seen, and obviously, Big Brother. There was a lot of love for it, and then also you get the the haters. The haters back off. Tell me about the haters. Yeah, with Big Brother, obviously, Hearts a bit. It's quite the audience is quite young, and everyone's accepting, and everyone just saw it as a positive. Me talking about my experiences, but with After Big Brother, there was a there was a lot of comments not on my page well on my page as well but block them um <laughs> but on like um other people saying how amazing it is and then i would like look on the comments and it would be like um he's faking it he's my my nine-year-old daughter's not like him he hasn't got autism it's like okay everyone's different uh wow. that's cool um you see one hour of 24 hours there was a lot of things going on in there i had, i did a post on it um and it was like always look at the the positives not the negatives and i did like a slide it was like all the negative comments then you slide it and it was all the positive t comments which makes everything worthwhile 100 percent. i mean that's part of why we're doing what we're doing right just lessen the the misunderstanding yes. or the ignorance Edu educate people <laughs> educate people and bring them up to date and so how i guess now today 2024 how do you see your autism showing up Obviously, now being in this industry, it's like, I love structure. So for example, it's like, when I know there's an event or something happening two weeks, I'm like, I need to know everything right now so I can just process everything. And then obviously in this industry, you're like, oh, tomorrow you're filming. You're like, oh God, am I, what am I doing? What am I doing? And then obviously events, you have to network and stuff like that. But my loops saved my life. Um, I was on the red carpet with my loops in, saves my life. Just, you just feel like you're in your own bubble. And then people start yelling, Brandon, you're like, I'm in my own bubble. <laughs> leave me, leave me. But yeah, I think especially in this industry, it's it, 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 the industry is built for neurotypical people, but I think slowly people are educating themselves and uh, making everything more accessible, like being on Big Brother. They they ask loads of things if I need any um, accessibility needs and stuff like that. So for me, I think it shows up, a, well, I like being at home with my dog and my partner and it's just chilling. That's lovely. Uh, but with events and stuff like that, that's 
it's a, it's the social element of saying the wrong thing of thinking people thinking you're rude or yeah it it shows up in different ways from just being anxious greeting people lights flashing in your face you're like, oh god get me home now <laughs> but yeah it's bearable and how do you manage i know we're not even talking about the positives here we're just talking about the challenges but yeah how how do you manage those challenges or how have you learned to manage those challenges yeah i think always having someone with me i think that's a massive thing and it was like when you get on the carpet fine that's one thing ticked off what do I do now? Like, why, why is everyone just staring at me? Like, do I just keep walking? What am I doing? So I think always having someone with me, obviously my loops, like I said earlier, block out, block out the noise. Which other coping mechanisms do I have? Oh, I have a nice bracelet and rings I like to play. I think as I've grown older and be more accepting with my autism, I think um, stimming, I lo- uh, that's a big, big go-to, which I didn't really know, realize I was doing in the house a lot. Okay. That, and there was a big video of it, like say, seeing Bradley stimming on screen is just so joyful. And I was like, was I stimming? And, and then I watch it and I'm literally doing this. I'm like, put my legs up, doing this. And I went, of course, yeah, that's me. Which just showed how comfortable I was in yeah. there with everyone who was there. Because a lot of the time like, you mask and um, don't stim because it's like, uh, like it's the shame of it type yeah. thing. All I hear is, I guess, you f- being kinder to yourself, more comfortable with who you are. Yeah having the opportunity and feeling of freedom to share that and that coming back at you in the majority a really positive, kind, loving, accepting way. Mm. But it hasn't always been like that. No, no, definitely not. And so how do you make sense of the difference of how it is versus how it was? A therapist once told me, they said, be the version of yourself that young you would be proud of. Um, someone who you would look up to. And I think me sitting here talking to you and doing all that different things I do, I think young Bradley would really love, I was about to swear then, but I'm not, <laughs> I was swear. like, really f- love, um, love me and be really proud. Obviously you're young, your parents, you rely on your parents a lot. They, yeah, when they see me, they, they're proud as well, which makes you feel just very, yeah, all the negatives just made all the positives worthwhile. Yeah, I I hear you. And what are the the good bits about being autistic for you? The good bit, there's so many. (laughs) Obviously, I'm me. It's like, and I've always been very creative, imaginative. I don't know if that's me being autistic or that's just me, but being autistic is a part of me. So my brain is very creative, very imaginative. I love love my determination, my uh, drive. I I love that. I love my my organisation. I love my notebook. <laughs> That's not my brain, but I love my notebook. And I think I love my my vulnerability as well a lot to show, because I, I wear my feelings on my sleeve. So it's my best friends know that I bloody love them a lot. My partner knows I love him. And if someone does, knows I don't like them, it's quite obvious. <laughs> but I like, yeah, the honesty as well. And the f- I, the joy, I think, I bring to people's lives. 100%. Oh, so good. Like to hear... <laughs> I mean this in a non-patronizing, condescending way, Bradley, but it's, you know, we had Tylan Grant on here and he's just an absolute thought. You guys would get on really well if you don't know each other, but mm-hmm. just hearing younger people own their stuff, own themselves and take it or leave it, this is who I am, is massively, yeah, is mega and admirable and gives me a lot of hope to keep doing that. I wanted (laughs) to, so I I went to a conference this week and it was a conference about uh, no and low alcoholic drinks. Yeah. And I was (laughs) myself and really anxious about it. I walked into a room of 120 people where basically everybody kind of knew who I was. Yeah. And that meant People came up to me, surprised me, hung around waiting to talk to me, like quite a lot of attention on a very, very small scale. That is like 120 people in a little microcosm and a little niche of the drinks industry happening in a little event in Waterloo on Tuesday morning. Yeah. I cannot even begin to imagine the journey that you've been through of being absolutely catapulted into the spotlight (laughs) and 
just suddenly everybody knows who you are and yeah, the public isn't now involved in your life. Mm. I mean, I see you've just sort of crossed your arms because I can feel like, or, yeah, the defense of like... <laughs> Get away. <laughs> uh, yeah, of like, just tell me about that. Yeah, I think it's it's crazy. I think I've never thought I'd have a public presence, but I think the the love, I always, I always say, look at the positives and it's like the love of people who wanted to speak to you, for example, wanted to do is just from a place of love. It's not, well, sometimes it's creepy, <laughs> but, but like, um, the, the, the end thing is they want to speak to you. They want to take a picture with you. They want to meet you because they love what you do. And I think I need to remember that that's obviously I've touched their lives and, and yeah, and I, I love meeting people. I think it's a, a lovely thing, but it's a lot sometimes, but yeah, it's, it's been a journey, I think, slowly, obviously, doing Heartstopper, that's worldwide, Mr. Worldwide, I'd say Mr. Worldwide. <laughs> um, that's like worldwide, and obviously, like, I think it's the audiences, so it's like, Heartstopper's like younger, well, everyone, a lot of people watch Heartstopper, but a lot of people who ask for it as a younger, then Big Brother's like, everyone, like, all ages. I like the way you saw point at me there. <laughs> all ages. <laughs> um, older people. <laughs> older people, plus 20. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it, it comes from, I always need to remember it comes from a place of love. Tell me about the creepy. <laughs> uh, so this is actually, fun. I don't think I've actually I've said this story. Well, I've said it to my friends. So let's say March, April, 2024, this year, before I started the musical, I um, was walking through Marlowe Station and this person taps me on the shoulder. I'm like, oh, a bit, a bit weird. I turn around and she's like, hello, um, I'm a big fan of yours. And she was saying that she saw me at Marlowe Station the day before. And I was like, Maybe she thinks I'm here every day. She was like, oh, I just, I work in Malibu and I, I've seen you around. And so she waited for me to get off the train, which is weird because like, I don't, my, my day's not the same every day. So it's weird. So I don't know how long she's been sat there for. And she goes, I'm a big fan. Pulls out a photo of me, which is kind of, people do that and you sign the thing. Oh yeah. Do you want me to write your name on it? Da, 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 da. And then she pulls out this, this lovely drawing of a tree. And I was like, oh, this is gorgeous. Thank you so much. She's like, oh yeah, keep it. And I was like, oh, okay. And I just looked at it quickly because I was in a rush. I was like, oh, thank you so much. Then um, she took a photo and she went. And then on my way, I got in my like, cab and I opened it up because I was like, oh, I'll see what this tree is. I opened it up and then I look at the top and it says family tree. And I'm like, what the heck? And then they, I didn't realize that they had like little, because I didn't look at it in detail. They had little like um, doors, like fake doors. And it had all my family on it. Like it was like people that I didn't even know existed. I was like, what the hell? She's like bought ancestry to look at my family tree. And I was like, this beautiful picture of a tree is lovely, but why the hell is my great, great, great granddad on it? And it was very weird. And then I did get scared and I did bin it. So if they are listening, I'm really sorry that I did bin it. But it was just one of the things, I'm like, is this tracked? I was like, really? So Because it was like, I just got off Big Brother. I was like, is this tracked? Will they now know where I am at every moment? So I just put it in the bin just to be safe. So then started rehearsals. And then she was there again. The at, same lady. Same lady, yeah. Um, at the rehearsal room, waiting there. And she's like, hello, picture, da, da, da. And then she came to stage door a lot of the time. And then I think as you see them a lot, obviously you remember them. You're like, oh my God, hello, how are you doing again? And then they start thinking you're friends or something. And I was a bit scared. And then, yeah, it was all a bit weird. And then she would like hug me like I'm her friend. I was like, oh, okay. Um, but yeah, it does get a bit weird, a bit overwhelming. But remember a place of love, but obviously creepy. Don't cross the line. <laughs> wow. Do people think you are your character? Yeah, I think... This is, this is actually a weird journey, actually, because it's like after Heartstopper, a lot of people, oh my God, Bradley did that, I love your James, did that, I love Heartstopper. And then you get a photo. And then after Big Brother, the weird thing I found, um, and usually like they're teenagers or stuff like that, the weirdest thing I found, so I came out of the house and I was walking down the road and it was construction workers. And they went, oh, you're Bradley from the telly. And I was like, what the hell? And I was like, this is not the audience I'm used to. And that was weird. And then, then you see people like, different events or like um like the red carpet you say there's loads of fans and stuff like waiting there and they're like oh bradley i love you and then you think and you're like oh god these people actually know me now like like obviously being on big brother it's me just me authentically me type thing and i was talking about like my journey with my autism being gay and it was like all these things like these people know me more than probably my some of my family but yeah it's like weird to have that journey of like oh i've got this comfort blanket of it's just a character no one knows me and then it's like now they they know me <laughs> i know that i I can be very gullible and very trusting. Is that the same for you? Yeah, I'm very lucky because I've got a good close friend unit. And I think in this industry, you you do meet people and you can become friends with them, but they're never going to be that. That is like, I would literally 
like my best friends, I would tell them anything and I knew that nothing would happen type thing. But obviously some people you meet in the industry, you, you wouldn't tell them everything. I think I'm the same as you. I trust people too much, but I know a lot of people warn you in the industry that not everyone's as real as they are. And I think to comfort and protect myself, I, I, I don't try and put too much trust in everyone. I think, yeah, it's, I trust people too much. So it's like, I don't want to get hurt. Yes. Um, yeah. Really important. Cause when you, you are, I guess, so publicly vulnerable and so publicly, uh, people are so aware of you. Yeah. I, I can imagine then there's obviously increased chances of people then wanting to take advantage of you. Yeah. Again, I know who my, my type bubble is and I like to, I like to keep it that way. Let's talk about Heartstopper for a minute because I know you auditioned for the first season. Yeah. Just tell me a bit about that, why you went for the role, what attracted you to it. My mum sent me this... Tw- I, I didn't know my mum. I was just deep I didn't realise my mum was even on Twitter. But anyway, she sent me this um, thing. It was like Heartstopper, uh, Netflix, Seesaw, um, series, open casting call for young people who resonate with these characters type thing. But it was a list of characters and obviously it did a little description, a playing age, who they are. And then you just had to, mum was like, oh, just go for this and see what happens type thing. And then you send it, I sent an email to the casting team and then you have to say which character resonates with you. And I obviously said, Charlie, he's a, a gay car- character in school. So I did a self tape. Now I think I did two and then I didn't hear anything. It was just, which I gathered was a, and then obviously I saw the casting the the leads on the um instagram I went, oh, okay well that didn't go my way fine and then i had a phone call randomly and they were like oh hello we we absolutely loved your tape and stuff like that sorry it didn't go your way and i was like oh thanks for telling me after you posted the, the cast <laughs> and then they were like but we we've got like some featured extras type thing like characters with no names our student three i think it was and we'd love to audition you for that and it wasn't really an audition it was more of just a meeting but because obviously they've seen me act in yes. them self-tapes but i did a a Zoom with uh, Lucy, who's amazing. She's one of the casting people. Um, and I had to say this, it was quite cringe actually. I had to say this one line. It was, sir, aren't you going to tell Nick Nelson he has to do the match? This one line on Zoom. And it was just you like, say nothing. Say that again? Sir, aren't you? <laughs> I, I say it exactly how I say it. I'm like, sir, aren't you going to tell Nick Nelson he has to do the match? <laughs> and it was like one of those things that was like, usually audition, you got, they read you some lines back. And it's like a long scene or something. And it was like, okay. And whenever you're, she's like screen recording the Zoom. It's like, when you're ready, three, two, one, go. Sir, and you're going to tell Nick Nelson he has to do the match. And I was like, like how are they auditioning me with That's this? It. Like, that is it. Full stop. And then she was like, oh, great. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll get back to you. And I went, if I don't get there, so you're kidding me. One line. I'm, I've, I've paid like to be at drama school. I can't even do this one line. And then I got an email. The ne- I think it was the next day or something. And I'm like, oh, we'd love Bradley to come in on the 13th of April or whatever it was to do the line. And, it was a, and I've never been on a set before. And it was the scariest thing I've ever done. Describe it for me. Like you walk, so first of all, you walk it. Luckily, I wasn't that starstruck because Heartstopper hadn't come out as the first season. But I think if it was season two, I would have been like, oh, I've seen you. But I walked on set and then everyone was just so nice. Everyone was just like, <laughs> Was Hello. Nick Nelson there? Yeah, yeah, everyone was there. Yeah, because I have to speak about him. And everyone's like, oh my God, lovely to meet you. And they're like, oh, you're student three. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> is, this like a, is this like a running joke? Am I a joke or something? And they're like, oh yeah, it's like such a, like a funny line because it is a funny line. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, I'm, am I meant to be funny in this? And then I started overthinking about how I'm going to say this line and it was one line it's not that deep then i sat around all day and they're like bradley you're up and i'm like oh god <laughs> student three student three bradley you're up and then nick nelson walks past and then i go and they're like this go and i'm like sir aren't you gonna tell nick nelson he has to do the match and i say it like that and i think they picked the weirdest the weirdest take but after that hearts of came out it obviously did very well and then it got renewed for season two and three and then I was on, I was actually doing extra work on Saltburn at this point. Um, so I was in this weird, like, grungy, abandoned building type thing. And I got, an e- I got a random email and I was like, oh, this is weird. Um, and it was from the person who booked me on Heartstopper. And they're like, hi, uh, um, we're just looking for this new character for season two um, for, I think it's called Electric, like, code word. Electric. You kind of get what it was. Because um, I was like, you've literally emailed me about Hearts for season one. <laughs> and they got electric and they're like, we're looking for this character, James. It was like sweet, lovable, gay character. And it goes on a journey with Isaac. I think that's the, kind of the brief they said. I was like, I, mean, I don't care what the brief was. I was like, yeah, of course I'm there. It was like three scenes. They're like, could you send in a self-tape uh, by Friday? 
And I was like, Have yeah. Have you seen season one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did. Do I need another subtitle? So I'm going to tell you what's going to do the match. Like, isn't that enough? And then, like, by Friday, and I was like, yeah, yeah. And then, obviously, I was on set, so it was a bit bit hard, but I was like, late night, I'll do it. And we have to give our phones in for Topman because you can't take pictures of Jacob and Lordy if you, if, if you wanted to. It was like, you can't because so you have to put them away for like leaking purposes. Then they emailed me the next day and was like, hi, uh, um, don't worry about the stuff tape. Can you do a meeting today? And I went, oh, luckily I learned the lines. I was like, I need to get these on, get good. And they're like, tomorrow. And I was like, oh my, what? And I was like, I'm on set. So I asked the person, I was like, can I go into a corner in this grungy place and just do a Zoom? So, you know, on Zoom, you only see one person. And I swept across, oh God. And it was like (laughs) the director, the writer, the producer, another producer, the casting team, and then Toby, who plays Isaac. I didn't realize he was going to be on it to read the scenes with me. Then I did the audition, obviously meeting Toby before in season one. So it was nice. It felt comfortable. Did the audition. Just over Zoom? Over Zoom, yeah. And it was three or three scenes. I had a bit more to say this time and I felt good about it. <laughs> and then, I, and then I, I remember doing the Zoom and I, I walk into the room and um, like in, in the scene, I walk in, I go, hey, Isaac. Um, and I don't know what came over me, but I left the room and walked through the actual door. <laughs> and the director goes, could you just do it like, just like just a slate, just stay, stay near the camera. <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Um, and then I had to do a kiss scene via Zoom. Oh, so I, wow. and I, went, I went, sorry, I've never done a kiss scene via Zoom. How does that work? And they went, just feel it. And I went, okay. So I went, and then I felt, I just, <laughs> then felt it. And I was like, I'm not going to put my lips on the camera because that's so embarrassing. But I did that scene. It went really well and I felt really happy about it. Then the next day they phoned me and was like, it's yours. And I was like, oh my God. Was autism mentioned anywhere within this? Yes. So when I got the contract and stuff, um, obviously you have to say if you've got any neurodiverse, uh, if you're neurodiverse or disabilities and stuff like that. And obviously I said, I'm autistic. And the first email, one of the first emails I think they said was like, is there anything we can put in place to make Bradley more comfortable? Nice. And for two things, first of all, it's like, if Netflix, a big thing can do that, anyone can do it. Um, and my second thing I was going to say is it was like, obviously the shame of growing up and I think that crept in at that moment and I think drama school it's like yeah this industry is not fit for neurodiverse people so don't expect too much that's what always I always like got told type thing so when they said that it kind of caught me off guard and I just went no nothing I'm fine um just to be like oh I'm grateful that I'm there maybe they'll see me differently if I say I need this I need that I need this maybe they'll go oh actually we're gonna go for someone else who's a bit easier to work with Will I sound like a diva? Mm. D- different things like that. But at the end of the day, I'm human. And if I need stuff, I need it. And I think now going forward, which Big Brother, they asked and I said, oh, this, this, this. And it's them seeing it and being like, oh, yeah, and not seeing it as... I think that's a scared thing. It's like being perceived as a diva, but it's not. It's just the way my brain works. So, yeah, that was very grateful. Every production I've worked with have, have been incredible. I've heard you say that really, if you're going to portray an autistic character... Oh, yeah. You kind of need to be autistic. Yeah. Just talk to me a bit about that. Like I said about Chloe Hayden, who's in Heartbreak High, is autistic, ADHD, and plays an autistic character. She, she, I watched, she does a lot of like TED Talks and stuff like that, and I watched one of them. And she was just saying, with being autistic, it's let autistic people tell those stories type thing. And it's not even like people always go, oh, yeah, but they're an actor. If they can act that well, then fine. But if you're playing a show an autistic story, you want to at least have a couple of autistic people going up for the role. But I think that's it. It's like with autistic characters, they don't want to work with difficult people. So they go with neurotypical people who are a, a bad stereotype of what autism is. And I think that's it. I think with the media, like I said, growing up, it's like you get one version of what autism is. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, oh, I don't fit that. So where the, where the hell do I fit? Like one of those comments said, my nine-year-old daughter, that's yes. one, like we're all different. And um, it makes you question your own self. It's like, Oh, am I autistic enough? I'm autistic. I'm, I'm full like, stop. Full stop. Yeah, it's like it's a spectrum. People like autistic brains are different. It's like I really strongly believe that autistic people voices should be via the stories. But even if someone can do a great job, let autistic actors audition. <laughs> that's the that's full stop. Really. Yeah, I I totally agree with that. And so, Heartstopper goes gangbusters. Amazing. I can imagine for people listening the one place that you would not want to go as an autistic person is into Celebrity Big Brother House. Yeah, yeah. It was a... <laughs> Tell me about that decision. I think, I th- yeah, it was a, a rogue <laughs> decision, I think. Um, but I think I've, I've always wanted, like I said, determination. I've always wanted to push myself. And I think 
if I didn't walk into that drama class and push myself, then where would I be now type thing? And it, it's always those taking the risks that I love. And once I got a routine in that, I bloody loved it. It was it was the same thing. Like you wake up at 9 a.m. every day, which we obviously don't know the time. You do know the time. It's in the oven. But they don't know that. And we're like, how long has the chicken been in? Nine hours? And then we would know what time <laughs> it is. But it's like you wake up at the same time every day. You then wake up, have breakfast, sit in the garden with Fern Britain, having a, a coffee and it, like a little As chit chat. And then Big Brother, then you're just waiting around for Big Brother to be like, get ready. You go and get ready. Thank you, Big Brother. Lovely bit of order. Go for a shower, get ready. Then they're like, okay, this is your task today. And they tell you a task. I'm like, love it. Thank you. That will take the majority of the day off. And then you go, okay, now it's dinner time. You have dinner. You go to bed. Same thing again. It's like, this is nice. And you have no phone, no distractions. You just speak with people. Obviously, the lights were awful. They were harsh white lights. But the bedroom lights were really nice. They were a bit more dim. But yeah, it 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 felt, I just felt so comfortable and it felt, it did become home and it was, it was nice. There was a nice order and then there was different things in place. So the production were like, if you ever need to speak to someone, you can go into the diary room and then say, can I speak to X, Y, and Z type thing? And they would turn the, they turn the, all the, so like this, they would turn all the lights off, cameras off, and then you just speak to someone mm. through a hatch. So it's not on telly, it's just, mm. just speaking. How long did it take you to get that? And I know that feeling when you feel a routine and you can really relax into it how yeah. long did that take you do you think i think it really early on and it surprised me i think so i think definitely the first week i think so so obviously all of it happened it was all a bit up in the air what the hell's going on day three the conversation with marisha that made me feel more comfortable that i've spoken to someone about everything and then it was that like you get a couple of days you're doing it and then there was a retreat task um and it was like libby walsh asked me like what what's one thing you regret? And I was like being so hard on myself type thing. And after that moment, I just, I was just so openly myself. And that's when I, I felt relaxed to tell people everything. So it was like, oh, maybe I do trust these people and these people are nice people. And then, yeah, so then I think it was after that, that was a pivotal, pivotal moment for me in there because everyone saw me for me and it wasn't, I wasn't hiding anything. It was just, and everyone loved me for me, which was really cool. And then, yeah, so after that, I've got, I said my piece, I feel like everyone knows the real me. And then from that moment, it was like, you're going to be a jockey for the day. And then you're going to, you're going to be a cop for a day. And I had to sit in a car outside all day. And then David was a bad cop and trying to distract me and I wasn't doing my job. And then sounds like a theatre production. Yeah, I mean, it was playful. I think that's, yeah. like, I remember firm, when we were locked in jail together, she was just like, it was like day, I don't know, eight maybe. And she was just like, as I was an old lady, she was just like, I haven't had this much fun and play and ever like I forgot what play is like and we're just being kids pretending to do tasks and stuff like that yeah it was so much fun talking of kids you've why did you decide to write a kids book I think it is again like the representation when I was younger be the person that young buddy would want so I think having a book that I people have messaged read in like it, when it came out people read it in the night it's easy to read it's light-hearted it's it has so much meaning in it and it has so like the best thing is when people like comment and stuff like that and it's like, oh, the book made me feel so seen. It's like, obviously every neurodiverse person is different. And a lot of that is my experiences mm -hmm. that I've put via a character. But as as long as you see two things in this character that you resonate with, that's you, that's like done my job type thing. It's difficult, isn't it? When autism, even just talking about autism, can portray and manifest so differently and mm. so individually for people. And you're talking to a kind of an audience out there who feel othered and excluded and different. Yeah. And there's this yearning to want to be seen and heard and fit in and not feel weird. And, yeah. and so it's a tricky balance, isn't it? Because you can't, I can't speak for all autistic people and yeah. you can't speak for all autistic people. Yet I want as many autistic people to feel seen and yeah. heard and to relate but the reality is that not everybody can relate because everybody's got their own different experiences 100%, yeah but that's why more i think that's why more voices and different autistic voices need to be heard and then everyone will feel seen so it's just like the more different voices autistic voices i think the more people feel comfortable with themselves i think yeah the more the more the better yeah you're also any more books in the pipeline well we're hoping we're hoping okay. we're, we're hoping I, I've, I've got ideas i've got a whole season it's gonna be you like, like writing yeah you? i love it it's gonna be the new heart stopper 
eight eight books ready. They're on the go. <laughs> and you have written or are writing a play? Yeah. So I the book the the book I brought out was so before that it was a play because obviously doing theatre. So then I I I I translated it kind of from okay. the play into a book and then published the book. Okay. Yeah. But the play you still want to do. Yeah, I still want to do the play, yeah. And that's, it's just you? Yeah, one person it will be, yeah. One person. You don't do things by halves, Bradley. No. Like, I, I, I think it's amazing that you, yeah, throw yourself into these, you, that you take risks, that you throw yourself into these situations that sound like they could be high anxiety, mm. high stress, high risk. High energy. Yeah. <laughs> high organization. Yeah. It was nice. uh, high creativity. <laughs> high imagination. So lots playing to lots of your strengths, but yeah. also whoa, sound quite tiring. How do you recharge? Uh I think as like this my schedule is busier. It's like I used to have a lot of time to recharge, like thinking, when then when am I what am I doing next? When's my next job? Thinking, oh God, what am I doing now? I've just done a Netflix series, I've got nothing else doing like coming up for me. Uh, but as obviously doing different things now, I always schedule in rest time. And I think that's a new thing. I think that's a, a big tip that I have for anyone, really. It's like you don't want to be burnt out and not enjoy the good things. So I had a rest, a rest time on Monday, and it just makes you enjoy the the ups better. Like I, if I was burnt out, the end tears would be the worst thing ever. Walking on a red carpet yeah. would like get me out of here. So yeah, that's one of my tips. I always say is like always schedule rest time, and because otherwise you're just not going to enjoy the best bits about everything. Type thing. Speaking of get me out of here, would you go on the jungle? Go to the jungle? Yeah, I would. I would like to the jungle. I think. Yeah. I think. I think. I think it's different from the house though, because obviously the house is like sensory wise it's like oh it's a house da, 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 it's fine but the jungle i hate being sweaty i hate <laughs> things on my face i hate yeah i feel like that would that i you'll probably if i get on it you'll probably see me have a breakdown on that one i mean that is your audition right there producers casting people yeah you've heard it right there that would be a little fly I'll be like get off me it's too much but i love to uh, again throw myself in the deep end yeah and so what did you do on your rest day chill you know you gotta chill have a cereal don't know why cereal but i love cocoa pops have a cereal um go on a nice walk with the dog and then i always try not to go on my phone so it's like a watch tv just like comfort things mm. like people may say to be fair it's not lazy i went on a walk there's like just a chill thing i like to write like i said i like to write so i write different things down ideas but not on my phone i don't want my little notebook um that's in my bag over there just write things down and just kind of like Think, but not think about work stuff. Just think about aspirations, I think. <laughs> and you're engaged? Yes. When are you getting married? We're thinking 2026. So okay. a bit a bit of, you know, planning time. Good, organising. Yeah, you know, yeah. Plan it ahead. I don't, I don't, if you said 2025, it was a bit too scary. It's like next, next week. Okay. And did you propose? No, he did. He did. Did you know? Well, we said, when I went to Big Brother, I was like, oh my God, if I win, imagine you just proposed to me. <laughs> As a joke. Didn't win. Um, but... And it was like, we, he was like, I just got out of the house and I was having all these meetings. Everything was really busy. And then he went, oh, I've um, emailed your agent and uh, we're going away in this break. And I was like, oh, okay. This is all a bit weird. And then he paid for me to go to Italy. And I was like, oh, that's lovely. Thank you so much. And then we went for dinner down the bottom of Sorrento, like on the beach. Yeah. And then he was like, where, why? And I was like, this is all a bit weird. And then we went up to the where our villa was at the top. And I got up there and there was like candles and like petals and stuff like that. I was like, oh God. And then I, me acting of like just my social cues just wasn't there. I went, oh my God, what is this? And I started taking pictures of the hut and I oh God, this is so cute. Um, and I was like, oh. And then next thing you know, he's like turned around. He's on the zoom. I was like, oh my God. Then I looked to the right and then there's a camera and I recognized the camera. And it was my best friend's camera. And he, he was like, oh, I couldn't have done this alone. And he opened the door and it was his best friend and my best friend. And they no. were there. And he, he bought, he paid for them to go to Italy as well. So he had organization i liked it props probably like going down yeah it was a really nice moment okay so how do you find being uh oh, this i don't mean to sound a weird question how do you find being autistic in a relationship yeah i think obviously past relationships it's it, you i feel like a lot with scott it's great because it's like you don't i don't explain myself a lot like i think all my past relationships i have to explain myself about everything and it's tiring and it's like i actually don't like you anymore <laughs> like this is a lot yeah obviously with relationships and being autistic is like 
it's probably not an easy ride. Like there's a lot of le- like you get to learn about someone, but an autistic or neurodiverse person is like you got to learn a bit, a little bit more about them and the way they they work type of thing. What do you think your fiance would say is the most annoying thing about you? When I'm not giving myself rest time, he would like. I think that's it, not giving myself rest time because when I'm burnt out, I'm like, I can't take the dog, just give me a minute. He's like, well, I told you. He, he like walks in, he's, you know, one of those things, well, I told you, you should have rested, you're doing too much. And I'm like, oh God, and I'm like, he's always right. But yeah, not giving myself enough rest time, I think. Or sometimes if like, for example, like there's a dish on the side, I'm like, I can't do it right now. I'm, just, I'm very burnt out. He's like, well, I told you, like, it's like the same thing. I told you to rest. Go and do it. <laughs> like I one of those days. So. I told I told you to do it. Don't blame it on the burnout. But yeah, yeah, he's very um accepting. And then what about what do you think he would say is the best thing? I think the joy I bring to people. I think I I have I like to bring joy to people. I think that's I think that's the You're very positive. Yeah, I think that's it. And you're funny. <laughs> Thanks. And so I can see how yeah, people would like to be around you. Yeah. What advice would you have for young neurodivergent people out there who are struggling just different and yeah what advice would you give them give yourself time i think because you always feel like you need to explain yourself to people like i said earlier explain yourself to people so i think being neurodiverse you want to learn everything about yourself so quickly in a short amount of time so you can explain yourself to people because sometimes you don't know why you're doing that so i think Give yourself time and don't put pressure on explaining yourself. Because I think as long as you know who you are and you understand yourself, then the world's your oyster. But give yourself time and it will be better for your well-being 100%. I think that's really sage advice. We asked you to bring something that represents your brain. Yeah. Okay, so all my all the people who follow me will know this. Describe it for our... Oh, listeners. Oh, yeah, yeah. for our listeners. So this is um, Froge. Froge. But it's basically to put your hair back when you do your makeup. But I wore it in Big Brother and the cells went off the roof for them. I'm glad a bit of promo for them. But yeah, so I wear this to bed because I love frogs. First of first. Why do you love frogs? Oh my God, no one's ever asked me this. This is amazing. So I love rainforests and um, yeah, frogs, the Amazon rainforest, which I found out actually someone put, said this to me. And I was like, what should they ask me what my favorite frog was? And I said, the Amazon rainforest frogs. Um, and then they're poisonous. I found out they're poisonous, but they're cute. So I like frogs because they're cute. They have personality. And I think they're just not represented enough. But anyway, yeah, so, so this is my frog A headband. It's green. It's got two eyes and it's not Shrek. Um, I had a lot of people saying, oh my God, I love your Shrek headband. And Big Brother I went, it's not Shrek, it's a frog. And basically I wear it to bed all night with my hair back because I have this thing, when I sleep, I don't like things on my face. Okay. Like hair, so it's like a sensory thing. It's like, because I, I have my little little curtains. I don't, during the day I'm fine, but when I sleep, if it, I don't like them on my face. I don't like anything near my face or, yeah, it's gross. So I wear this to feel more sensory free and just feel great about myself. So yeah, it pulls my hair back and now I've got a receding hairline. <laughs> and I don't know how it represents my brain, but I think, it helps my brain. Well, I mean, it sits kind of on your head, on yeah, your brain. Yeah, it's actually on my brain. Yeah. Um, I've got loads of them. You should, um, I'll send you one. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're really funny, Bradley. <laughs> and I, yeah, I don't mince my words. So I really mean that. Oh. You've made my eyes well up with laughter, <laughs> which is great. And just fascinating to see, like, you're just at the beginning. You've got this whole amazing future ahead of you. Amazing that you are... Yeah, standing up and speaking up for autistics and you know, the neurodivergent community and applaud you for that and just say, please keep doing it. And yeah, just thanks for giving us your time, your voice and your brain. Thank you for having me. And your frog. <laughs> and my fr- frog A. Frog, frog yeah. sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, frog A. I've actually got a rainbow one as well. And so that one's frog gay gay. That one's really gay. <laughs> Thanks, Bradley, for coming on The Hidden 20%. Thank you for having me. Because I'm autistic, I think differently. And back in 2015, I wanted people to drink differently. So I created Seedlip, the world's first distilled non-alcoholic spirits. I took Seedlip from my kitchen to 35 countries 
and the world's best bars, restaurants, and retailers. And we did it in three and a half years. It was wild. They're delicious. They're intriguing. They're these distilled botanical blends you can just mix with tonic or have in a cocktail. You really don't need another sickly, horrible mocktail. Check us out on sealipdrinks.com or Amazon and let me know what you think.